much for being here. You know, I was rolling around in my head, you know that 7.15 in the morning on Thursday of show week would show up to a presentation about anxiety and athletic trauma. What a light and happy topic to start your morning off with. But I appreciate you all being out here. I see some familiar faces from yesterday's presentation, coaching juniors in the mental game, and some of you from Vegas and past PGA shows and some of my other presentations. My name is Dr. Allison Kurt. I'm a PGA Master Professional and an LPGA Master Professional. There's only two of us in history that have accomplished both of those educational backgrounds. And I'm also a doctor in psychology. I practice as a licensed psychotherapist. And I'll explain a little bit more about that as we move forward. But I am the director of instruction at a club in Los Angeles called Wood Ranch Golf Club. So I teach during the day and I see clients at night. I was also thinking to myself, what kind of person would show up at 715 for this type of presentation with such a light and airy topic? And it made me think, you either need MSRs, you yourself may have struggled with anxiety or have students that you're coaching that have anxiety, or maybe your players and you play in your section events, maybe PGA National Championship, and maybe you've had some things that have happened in your life that's holding you back from playing your best golf. But today, I think not only are you gonna expand your knowledge about anxiety and what is this term athletic trauma to kind of enhance your world and your education and teaching and coaching, but you also wanna walk away with some tools that you can add into your toolbox that you can use on yourself to help you perform better and that you can translate to your students to help them perform better. Anytime that we're looking at being the best version of ourselves, sometimes we have to reflect on our weaknesses. And so this is a great opportunity for you to take some of these skills and maybe evaluate if it's gonna help you be a better presenter for your club's boards if you're asking for a lot of money and you've got to sit in front of the board and make a presentation. If you're gonna be up on stage sharing your wealth of knowledge, maybe doing a big clinic with 400 participants, and you're talking about your teaching prowess, and you get nervous or anxious before you perform. These are all skills that you're gonna be able to take away today to help you perform better. So I wanna share a little bit about my personal background, how I went from being a golf professional to a therapist and marrying them together and what sort of interests me in looking at athletic traumas. It's not a very happy topic to look at. It can be a very painful topic to look at. And a lot of that came from personal experience. And how that put me into the place today to now be sort of a speaker on the topic for golf professionals, for teachers, for you to help your students be the best and also for you to play your best. Two topics that we're gonna to cover today, we're gonna to look at anxiety what it is, how it shows up in golf, how it shows up in you, what you might see in some of your students, and then what you can do about it. And then we're gonna move into the second section. We're gonna talk about this term athletic trauma, also known as adverse life events. Things that have happened in our world that has prohibited us from moving forward. Maybe you feel stuck in one aspect of your life. Maybe it's not growing your business or you're not performing the way that you want to on the golf course. What does that really mean? How can you overcome that? One of the strategies to help us become unstuck and move past our past is through a psychological modality, meaning what sort of strategy would you take with a client? EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, and then a derivative, of that, a derivative of that called tapping. So you'll learn a little bit about that and you'll have some experience to test that out on yourself. Maybe you'll take that home with you to use. As a player, I played for over 30 years. I know I look young. I started when I was real small. As a player, I've had more failures than I've had wins. And we all know that on the golf course. You look at tour players and they may have one win in 10 years and a whole bunch of failures. What do you do with that? Well, as a failing player, 
which also means I had a bunch of success and I felt like I had success, but there were certainly some things along the way that were really painful or really hurtful. I wanted to know how can I get past that because it keeps, see, seems to keep coming up in my life. And even though I might be a collegiate player, things that happened when I was a junior player still seem to run through my mind. And in college, I became stuck. Was a successful junior player, got into college, and it didn't feel like I reached my potential. Had a little bit of experience with a sports psychology student who was doing some research on the women's golf team and how thoughts and emotions impact performance. So I had a little bit of dabble in sports psychology there to try to help me. I had, of course, all the mainstream sports psychology books that were out there. Dr. Bob Rotella and Pia and Lynn were coming out with their fabulous material. But it didn't really help me perform better. It gave me more information, but I still felt like something was holding me back. And the further I got into my playing career, as I became a PGA professional, I played a lot of section <laughs> events, and an LPGA professional, I was trying to buy for national championships, still felt like, gosh, why can't I break through this barrier? And then it hit me that every time I got into certain scenarios, memories would come up about times that I didn't perform really well. And when those memories came up, then anxiety started to pop up too. Things that I started to become nervous about, I'd never been nervous about earlier on in my career. Being on the lesson tee, I noticed that my students were experiencing the same sort of things. A new golfer coming to a lesson, being nervous about taking a lesson. They're there for help and they're nervous about giving help or my nervousness, my anxiety about teaching in front of a group. What was that about? So I realized that golf pros are more than just tacticians where we're fixing swing flaws. We're also sort of innate therapists at heart. And you listen to your students' stories and you listen to what they bring with them to the lesson to you learn about their families. Why not have some basic skills to understand what your student may be going through? So that motivated me to go back to graduate school and earn my master's in clinical psychology and then eventually my doctorate in clinical psychology with an emphasis in sports psychology. From there, I decided to practice professionally, became licensed. In California, you have to do over 3,000 hours of clinical practice before you become licensed. That's a lot of patients, a lot of clients. And then I really wanted to have this repertoire of tools to work with a player holistically, to see them on the tee, understand, well, what's happening in their ground reaction forces? What's happening in, in how they're moving the golf club? What's the path doing and the swing, uh, the, the face angle doing and the angle of attack? What's all that doing? And what about their state today? What happened with their spouse before they came to the lesson tee? Did they have a conflict at work that is causing changes in the golf club right now? that maybe don't show up on Saturday morning when they're more relaxed? What happens on the golf course when someone starts to smoke and drink and they get into a more relaxed state and use coping mechanisms? So that's kind of this convoluted way of me taking these two worlds and bridging them together. And in the whole scheme of things, all of that information helped me perform better. And it allowed me to break through my personal performance barriers and so far have played in five LPGA national cha or LPGA championships on tour, and I'm going into my sixth one in June. Was one of two women to qualify for the PNC in 2018, and the only woman to make the cut last year. So these things not only helped me, they helped my teaching, and now they're helping my students, and I hope the same do for you too. So as you are now, embracing this identity of you're a golf professional, you're a golf teacher, and you're also a pseudo-therapist, some of the things that you're going to see on your lesson to you that your students are going to bring with you are adverse life events. Things that have happened in their world that are traumatic and still trigger them. Perhaps you have a tournament in mind that, as I bring that up, comes into your memory of where maybe you were leading the tournament and then on the last hole something happened and you ended up not winning that tournament. It still stings right here. Or perhaps you had a presentation in front of the board asking for a lot of money for your new performance center and you made a mistake and you were kind of embarrassed and you ended up not closing the deal and you didn't get that. 
We all have adverse life events or athletic traumas in our life, every single person. In fact, the statistics show that at least 90% of you have five or more traumas in your life that are significant. That's the average. And nearly 100% have at least one. Communication. We're supposed to be masters of communicators when we're on the lesson team. We're trying to use different communication modalities with our students, with our juniors. But communication goes all the way back to our families, maybe the player and the caddy. How that communication is delivered and perceived, most importantly, can impact performance. If you've ever coached a junior throughout their childhood into their teenage years into college, you might start to see an evolution of how that communication evolved. If anyone was at the PGA Teaching and Coaching Summit Sunday and Monday, I found it very interesting. Um, I'm sorry, it was that open forum. Bryson DeChambeau's coach was making a presentation and he talked about the evolution of that communication. Sometimes it got very toxic and sometimes it was very harmonious. That can impact performance. Goal setting can impact performance. If you don't have goals set in your business, how do you know where to go? Are you growing? Are you regressing? Are your students setting goals? Maybe they have no direction, so the performance is gonna be stymied. They go to the practice tee and they practice the same things over and over, and they're just sort of plateaued. Another area that can impact performance. Of course, we all know about regulating emotions. Are we club throwers? Are we internal angry individuals that end up turning into <coughs> more sadness and depression because we hold that anger inside? Another element to impact performance. As I go through these, are you starting to say, oh gosh, I can think of all these students that have some of these, or maybe I remember a time in my life that these things impact my performance. Confidence. If you don't have confidence, how are you gonna have the courage or the motivation to start doing new things. Things that you've done so many times in your life, all of a sudden now, confidence starts to be depleted. We've all had students that talk about, I want to be more confident doing this. We're in a <coughs> world of distractions. Phones are in our hand, we have social media, there's a lot of stimuli in our environment. Concentration, if your students can't concentrate, if you can't concentrate and stay focused on the lesson T, that can impact performance. And then individuals that have clinical diagnosis of ADHD certainly have another level of an obstacle to overcome. Can we relax in pressure, pressure situations? Do we know how to use this, this term mindfulness, use meditation to be relaxed in pressure situations so you can perform? Certainly the yips is a very hot topic in sports psychology player all of a sudden comes down with the yips and their career is destroyed, or they have to figure out a way to reinvent themselves, an anxiety-based disorder, we call it. And then imagery and visualization. Individuals that don't have basic sports psychology tools aren't going to be able to perform the way they want to, and it can certainly limit their performance. So these are all things as teachers and coaches that you're going to have to have a little bit of experience talking about to your students, or at least have the verbiage to be able to open up dialogue with your students. And a lot of this can come from your own personal wisdom. That certainly helps our students. I want to ask you a question, or several questions, and think back in a round of golf if any of these scenarios have applied to you. Have you ever had excessive worry or anxiety about performing on the golf course? Let's say getting nervous before a big tournament. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever found it difficult to control the levels of that anxiety? The levels of those thoughts? Have you ever had those thoughts start racing in your head? What about your mind going blank? Or difficulty concentrating? All of a sudden you hear everything. One person's shoe moves a little bit on the grass and you hear it, those rabbit ears stick up and sounds start to become amplified. Have you ever had muscle tension while playing in a tournament that hasn't helped you swing the golf club? 
Have you ever had dry mouth, trembling hands, or your voice sort of quiver as you're playing in a big event? Or maybe doing a big clinic in front of a bunch of really important people? That uneasy feeling in your stomach, that nauseousness? Maybe you know you're about to win the tournament, you've got a four-stroke lead, heading into the last hole, and all of a sudden your stomach turns. And do any of that worry and physical symptoms create disruption in performance? Do you lose your flow a little bit? Raise your hand if any of these have been experienced by you on the golf course. 100%. <coughs> so this is actually the criteria for anxiety use disorder from the DSM-5. The DSM-5 is basically, in psychology, a bible, if you will, of every single clinical diagnosis that can be used. And so I took that criteria and I adapted it to golf and we basically call this performance anxiety. Now the degree that these certain things occur can become more clinical based, where you might need to see a sport psychologist or a therapist, or even maybe move into a different direct direction with anxiety for medication or panic disorder. But if you just felt any of these because you're a natural human being and it's a natural response, you can have performance anxiety. It doesn't necessarily have to happen on the golf course. It can be performance anxiety if you're getting up in front of a large group, making a presentation, being in front of your club's board. So anxiety in golf can be biological, can be situational, and can also be learned. So when we look at the biology of anxiety, it's a natural human response. Our body responds in an anxiety way because it's a warning sign. Now some of you may have seen this model before, but I like to use Dr. Dan Siegel's hand model about how the brain works. And if you understand some of the structures in the brain, it gives you a little bit of power of knowing how to control your anxiety. So if you want to join with me, I want you to hold up your hand. And this is going to be the model of our brain so we understand the biology of anxiety. Our forearm going up to our hand, let's imagine that's our spinal cord. And if I take my thumb and I fold it in, this structure, we're going to call that the limbic system. Some of you may have heard that before. And that's really in charge of a lot of emotional components. It has many, many different roles. But it has emotional component, components. It warns us for danger and situations. And the thumbnail, we're going to call that the amygdala. Some of you may have heard about the amygdala and its role in golf. And we're going to say that its primary role for this presentation is going to be the storage of emotionally charged memories. It remembers the emotions of all of your experiences. So if I take my hand and I fold it over, we've got our brain that's building, we're going to call this the cortex. Cortex is that wrinkly part that you see on the brain, and that helps us understand what's happening in the outside world. It applies meaning to the outside world. And when you turn your hand to the side and you have the front of your knuckles, we're going to say that's the prefrontal cortex often talked a lot about in golf, and that's our judgment. That's the formation of what could happen in this cause and sequence of the events. So we've got this great little hand model here. Now, the limbic system is folded all up inside. Something anxiety-provoking happens, and you have three responses, fight, uh, flight, or freeze. Freeze is not talked about too often. We'll talk about that in a moment. You have something super anxious that's happening to you. Your body cannot hand, handle it. The limbic system starts to go out of control and you literally flip your lid. You start shaking, the heart starts to race, you can't think clearly. Everything from the inside of the brain is saying, hey, I can't handle this, and you flip your lid. Now, when you understand that structure, it kind of gives you a little bit of power of like, gosh, this little limbic system here, if I can get that under control, I might be able to control my anxiety. When we talk about fighting, flighting, or freezing, freezing is not talked about a lot. And that is when something overwhelming happens and you can't think straight and you just stop and you're paralyzed. You can't bring the club back. 
You know, you can't make a punt, you can't move, you can't walk. And that's one of the third responses researchers say can also happen. Situationally, you may become anxious just because it's a brand new experience and you sort of fear the unknown. You've never been in that experience. So anxiety can truly just be temporary and situational. And then anxiety can also be learned. If you have the same experience over and over and you continue to be anxious in that same situation, your body starts to adapt of, oh, this is the way I should respond. And for a lot of people, that's first T jitters. They have first T jitters, they perform, all of a sudden the next tournament comes up, they get that same sensation, they have no tools to be able to cope with it, first T jitters again. Well now eventually they start to pair and associate Every time I'm on the first tee, I'm going to feel nervous. And that doesn't have to happen. That's where you as a coach can actually help your students improve. Where does anxiety come from? A lot of times it's the brain's interpretation between the difference in the skill set that you possess and the demands of the environment. If you're a brand new golfer and you're a 30 handicap and you play in the a flight of the club championship, is that a difference in skill set and the demands of the environment? It sure is. If you're a brand new junior golfer and you get into AJGA and mom and dad put you in AJGA and you see these children who are shooting under par and you're barely breaking 85, is that a difference in skill set and the demands of the environment? That can create anxiety. When the perception of what you possess, your confidence levels, your self-esteem, self-efficacy, and your skill set does not meet the demands of the environment. Your past history, whether it's been an embarrassing moment, whether you've had some sort of perceived failure, your past history can start to create some levels for your anxiety. Perhaps you played in the PNC and you didn't make the cut and you had a really, really big number and all of a sudden now you qualify again for the PNC and you have anxiety going into that tournament. Personal example in past histories of failures or embarrassment for me personally is I remember leading the state championship. I'm born and raised in Missouri and was the number one player in Missouri before I got recruited to play for Florida State. And the senior year, everyone's touting me to win. Have a great first day have a great 17 holes of the second day. And I get into the last hole, the 18th hole, and I knew that I was gonna win this tournament. And I had a triple bogey and finished in second. So now anytime I got moving forward in my playing career onto that last hole, and I knew that I was in the lead, that memory, that past embarrassment, that past perceived failure came into my mind and created anxiety. Oh no, is this going to happen again? And you've probably heard your students say that on the practice range. They hit that blade across the green and they, oh no, here it goes again. I can't chip anymore. Is it fear of the unknown? Is it a brand new situation you've never been into? You don't know the conditions and you have anxiety. Very, very normal. A lot of social phobias come up from this. You go into a big room, you don't know anybody, fear of the unknown, what's going to happen, anxiety can hit. Performing in front of others and judgment. I see this a lot with, uh, there's a group at my club called the Pitch and Sip Group. Higher handicapper, ladies, beginners. They all talk about the same thing. I'm so nervous getting in front of my friends and having to hit a shot. Because what might they think of me if I don't hit this shot well? And I tell them, hey, P.S., most of the time people are worried about their own golf game. They don't care what you do, actually. <laughs> so we're not too concerned about that fear of judgment because they're so involved in their game. But the fear of judgment, the fear of what people might think of them can start to create anxiety. All of this can lead to choking, which is a fascinating, fascinating condition. When you practice something over and over and over, to where you can't get it wrong, and then you do get it wrong, in a situation where it really matters, that hurts. That can create anxiety. The excessive anxiety can create that choking. And we've all seen on the professional levels, because everybody likes to talk about it, when a player is going to the last hole or the last round, chokes. 
So let's look at the physical and the psychological symptoms of anxiety. I think that's important because if you understand your physical symptoms and you can start to identify them earlier on, you might be able to start to implement some coping strategies so that the anxiety doesn't take you into a different place where you can't perform. And what about if you taught your students to notice their anxiety, their physical and psychological symptoms, so that they could eliminate and cope with the anxiety before it happens? We certainly know that anxiety creates tension, so the flow in our golf swing is going to be eliminated. Whenever that tension starts to pick up, then our mind makes perceptions about what does tension mean. You might start to see it in the shoulders raise. Look at your player's jawline. You'll start to see when their jaws become real tense. And I think golf pros naturally look at hands and forearms. How tight are you gripping that golf club? And is it because they don't know or is it because they're starting to become anxious? <coughs> Shaking and trembling. When you look at individuals' hands, that's typically the first place that you'll start to see a lot of the shaking and trembling show up. So you've got a player who's all of a sudden nervous and they're grabbing their putter. It's gonna show up in their hands real quick for anxiety. The rhythm becomes off. So now you're looking at chipping rhythm and someone's becoming anxious because maybe they've had a bout of the shanks. So one stroke is super smooth and the next one becomes punchy and erratic. Anxiety can also create tiredness. Because the body is really overwhelmed and there's so much going on, you become tired, you become fatigued. And then lastly, rapid heartbeat and shallow <coughs> breathing. Sort of the basis of the beginning of panic attack. Clients that I work with that have histories of panic attack, they need to know their physical symptoms really well so that they know when that panic attack is going to start to evolve and what can they do to contain it. So the heart starts to beat faster, then all of a sudden our breathing shallows, we're not getting a deeper, deep enough exchange of oxygen. All physical symptoms associated with anxiety. Our psychological symptoms, the perception of what we're thinking is happening to our body, we have overwhelm feeling. Oh my gosh, I can't handle this. I want to run away. Panic might start to set in. The basis of sort of panic disorder. We become scared. What's happening to my body? Worry. Those thoughts start to become rampant. We start to make interpretations about what all of this means. It can even lead into confidence. Oh gosh, if my body is responding this way, I'm really worried about this big tournament. I must not be good enough. And oftentimes, there's going to be a rushing sensation. Everything's moving really fast. Thoughts are moving really fast. My body's moving really fast, and it's hard to slow down. So I challenge you to look at your own personal anxious responses and get to know them really well and use that in your teaching to explain to your students, here are some things that you might notice. Be an investigator about them. And when you start to notice them, then we can use some tools to help you cope, which I'll show you here moving forward. How to coach students with anxiety. You all have really, really deep toolboxes. Things that you use to help hookers, things that you use to help slicers, things that you use to help people who are shaking the golf ball. Well, do you have a toolbox to help you deal with anxiety? Deep breathing is certainly going to be your best friend. Can you teach an individual how to deep breathe? Easiest way to do it is hand on your belly, hand on your chest. Take a breath, which one raises? If my belly, the hand on my belly raises, I'm a deep breather. If the hand on my chest raises, I'm a shallow breather. If I'm breathing shallow, I'm not getting a deep enough exchange of oxygen. So your student starts to become nervous and say, I'd like you to check in on your breathing for me. Put a hand here, put a hand here, take a breath, see which one raises. It also gives them something to do so that they don't get carried away by that anxiety. Meditation and mindfulness. 
I know that can be a scary term. Oh my gosh, I'm going to meditate and sit with my hands like this. I'm going to raise cross for 20 minutes. Meditation can be done in one minute. I have wonderful links that I share with my students that range from one minute all the way up to 60 minutes. They pick the time that feels comfortable for them. They sit and they listen to the meditation. All of a sudden, they start to feel calmer. Being mindful. Best definition of mindfulness, doing one thing at one time and knowing that you're doing it. So if you are standing over a three-foot putt, you are standing over a three-foot putt. You're not thinking about the outcome of the putt going in or missing. You're not thinking about what your playing competitors think about you. You're not thinking that, oh my gosh, the path of my putter is becoming erratic. Those are extraneous thoughts. Doing one thing at one time and knowing that you're doing it can help that anxiety. What's important right now? A pre-shot routine. What do you do in terms of a habit to help you feel comfortable before you hit the shot? And are you teaching your students to have a pre-shot routine, not just so that they can see the shot, not just so they can pick the right club, but to actually help their body regulate and get into a good state? Pre-shot routines really help with that, and then you can teach them what are task-relevant cues and what are task-irrelevant cues. When I'm standing behind my drive, a task irrelevant cue is going to be drawing my attention to the water left when I know that my miss is left. A task relevant cue is going to be feeling my feet on the ground, feeling my hand gently grip the grip, putting my golf ball into the grass, things that are relevant to the task at hand. When you redirect your attention to the task at hand, your body can't potentially start focusing on the anxiety anymore. Becoming a master of your timing. Are you pre, are you timing your pre-shot routine? Really interesting stat that I saw in Scott Fawcett's presentation at the Teaching and Coaching Summit earlier this week was he went and he timed Tiger at his best from the time that he walked from his pre-shot routine to impact. And at his best, it was 13 seconds every single time. And it was really cool how he put this video together. Are your students doing the same pre-shot routine? Are you doing the same pre-shot routine with the exact same timing? Having keywords can certainly be helpful. So all of a sudden you're feel, feeling um, overwhelmed with the anxiety. Do you have one or two statements? Keywords that can help you calm down. So maybe you're in your pre-shot routine and you just repeat smooth, relax. And that's all of a sudden your cue word to switch out of anxious and into being present. And you can use an anchor. An anchor is just a physical sensation tied into the cue word to really help your body feel like you're in the right state. I have a colleague who would always touch his middle finger to his thumb. So he'd stand in his pre-shot routine. As soon as he touched his middle finger to his thumb and said his cue word, smooth. Then it was ready to rock and roll, get into hitting the shot. Teach your students this. Certainly how we desensitize anxiety is experience. <laughs> Completely natural to be nervous in your first golf tournament, so go do more of it. One of my life mentors was in my presentation yesterday, and she was so influential in my life because I remember one of my earliest junior golf tournaments, I hit like seven golf balls in the water on this one hole. I almost ran out of golf balls in my bag, but it was one of the very first tournaments that I played in. And afterwards, she was also my basketball coach. Afterwards, uh, my mom was talking to her, and I sort of had tears coming down my face. I lost seven of my golf balls. She said, play more. Play more, and I want you to play in a higher age group, too. So she challenged me to keep getting experience, to keep feeling these anxious symptoms, so that I'd become desensitized and wouldn't experience that anymore. Another great way to work with anxiety Anytime you have an uncomfortable emotion in your body, if you use this system, you can gain control over it. So, oops, go backwards here. Notice where it is in your body. Where do you feel anxiety? Is it in your jaw? Is it in your chest? What shape is that sensation? If you're feeling the anxiety in your chest, is it a square? Is it a triangle? 
What color is it? Red, orange, fiery yellow. Put a name to it. You can use the term anxiety. You can use the term, had a student one time call it her anxiety monster. So she could feel her anxiety monster right on her chest. Once you're able to create the location, the color, and the, and the shape of it, you've got a name to it, you own it. Take a deep breath, blow it out of your body. Take that fiery triangle that's sitting in your chest, blow it out of your body. It gives the student something to do, it gives you something to do if you're feeling anxious. And it really allows you to take control over the emotions so that you don't feel overwhelmed anymore. Okay, so now you're all experts in anxiety. We're gonna go through athletic trauma. Now I wanna ask you, think back into your golfing history. Do you have any distressing memories of past events? Sort of like my whole 18 high school state championship. Do you have any memories like that? Have you ever had any dreams about a failed performance? All of a sudden that thing happens at your section tournament, you had a bad dream about it, you wake up in a cold sweat, scared that it's gonna happen again. Maybe you're playing in a tournament and you have flashbacks of that event come through your mind, hoping that that shot never comes up again. Usually happens if you've ever hit a shank. And you all know it, people who laugh know it. Have you ever been anxious or nervous in a situation that is so similar to when you failed it? Like every time you get over that short putt, maybe it's one foot, all of a sudden you start to feel that nervousness. Negative thoughts start to pop into your mind, all of a sudden you're like, I want those thoughts to go away. They're so negative, how do I get out of this pattern? And you've done things to avoid that feeling. You've done things to avoid the sensation of those memories. Maybe you talk a lot with your colleagues in your group. Maybe you start smoking because it helps you relax. Or you start drinking while you're on the golf course because you don't want that feeling to come back. The attempts to avoid that situation remind you of that failure. So everything you do to get away from that sensation and that memory just doesn't work. Any of you feel this at all? Anyone who's had a massive failure on the golf course? It's a criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. If you have enough of these, you can actually be diagnosed as PTSD. I'm not saying any of you in the room do. I know I have golf PTSD. First LPGA major championship that I played in was also my first LPGA champion or LPGA tour tournament that I played in. First round, I think I was in the high 80s. I was like, oh my gosh, who's this club pro coming and shooting in the high 80s when I know that I could shoot in the low 70s, high 60s. She certainly had some PTSD about that tournament. Had to overcome. Here's a short video I want to uh, show you about golf traumas. Probably not going to be able to hear the sound. But you'll certainly get a chance to see the video. Anyone remember watching Ernie L's six putt? Or not want to remember when Ernie L's six putt? <laughs> I only pulled that one because that happened in St. Louis. 92 when I was a little kid. I remember Rory's four putt? Which one should be the answer? It's not getting any closer. Yeah, it's getting farther away. How does that work? Number one player in the world can duff it just like everyone else. And I hate to put poor Lexi up there twice, but she just, those short putts.
heartbreaking. You think that's not going to stick with him for a while? Jordan Spieth, most relevant. And if anyone remembers the year after, same thing happened on that hole again. Now, this is the livelihood of those players. So from the outside looking in, oh, he free putted, he still makes millions and millions of dollars. But to that player, when that's their world, that hurts. And that sticks with them. And you can't say that when Jordan Spieth had all of those shots in the water, and the next year he gets to the same hole and the exact same thing happens, that there wasn't some sort of triggering or trauma that occurred? Certainly, we all have traumas. Now, there's a couple of definitions of trauma, so maybe at the beginning of this seminar, you had an interpretation of what that really means, a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. That's what the, the, the dictionary tells us. And in 94, the American Psychological Association said, if you had an experience or witness an event where you felt like your life was in danger, but that's really been modified because you can have trauma by proxy. 9-11, anyone who watched what happened on TV could have had traumatic symptoms from this huge thing that impacted everyone. So it's actually a deeply disturbing event that interferes with your sense of control. And it may reduce your ability to take what happened and integrate it into your reality, meaning denial. So if you are the best player in the world and you three putt to lose a major, that is certainly a deeply and distressing event. That's the definition that we're looking at when we're talking about athletic traumas. And there's two different types of athletic traumas. We have large T, we have small T. Large T are going to be those really, really horrific events that we think of, natural disasters, victims of violent crime, those that have served our country and are war veterans. Those are large T traumas. You don't really experience that all too much on the golf course. Small T trauma, absolutely. Divorce, getting fired from a job, going bankrupt, legal troubles, Severe conflicts in interpersonal relationships. Maybe you've worked with a tour player and they fired you. And that hurt your ego and it hurt your confidence. Those are also called adverse life events. Those sort of things, as they run through our mind, they continue to perpetuate throughout our life. They can interfere and they can cause other sort of issues, anxiety issues. The Yips has two theories on how it starts, either in, basically in, in a Cliff Notes version, an overemphasis on um, the actual process of what's happening, becoming too analytical about what's going to happen, and number two is something really traumatic has happened and it's created an anxiety response, and now all of a sudden the person can't putt anymore, or can't chip anymore, or have a colleague who has the driver Yips, hit the driver so bad traumatic for that person, can't hit the driver anymore. It's certainly going to chip away at your self-esteem, your self-doubt, create fear, anxiety, but now you have some tools to help with that anxiety. It can actually lead into feeling helpless and hopeless, and then you're going to want to avoid situations that mimic that trauma, so maybe you don't play that golf course anymore. For me, it was Industry Hills in Los Angeles. I played so bad at Industry Hills, I was like, I'm not going to play that golf course again. I'll go anywhere else. I'll go to any other U.S. Open qualifier, but I'm not going to Industry Hills again. So my response to that event is I'm going to try to avoid 
So maybe you end up doing that or you don't play in tournaments anymore because you had a bad experience in that. Well, our students do the same thing. If your students ever said to you, I'm never gonna play in the club champ again, they probably had a little bit of a traumatic experience. The brain is capable of processing stressful life events to a point. And sometimes when you have a stressful life event, you pull out information that's really helpful for you. So that the next time you get into a situation, you have learning that has occurred. But there are times when you've had such a stressful life event, it becomes so overwhelming for your body. Go back to your brain model for a second. It becomes so overwhelmed for your body, your brain cannot process it, and it can't pull out information for learning. So it ends up becoming stuck. And it's sort of this open wound, this open psychological wound, that every time you are in a like or similar situation, you become triggered, you become repained. The most personal example that would relate to all of you is if you've ever been in a relationship and it broke up, and then you saw your ex, and it really hurt. That's an open wound. That's being re-triggered by seeing somebody that you broke up with. So getting into a 10-foot chip and having a history of blading it across the green and all of a sudden your student becomes triggered by another 10-foot chip because they feel like they're going to blade it again. History told them that and they have a trauma that's stored in their brain. So EMDR is a tool that psychologists and licensed therapists can use to help that trauma become unstuck. Now you as golf professionals aren't going to be able to use this for your students, but if you have knowledge about it, then you can find a specialist in your area. And it may greatly help you. It may also greatly help your students. And it's the ability to take that stuck memory, no matter how old it is, and to reprocess it in a healthy way so that it doesn't become triggering anymore. EMDR is, is basically another modality, which you have psychodynamic theory, where you think about what happened in your life as a little kid. You have cognitive behavioral, where you think about your thoughts and how they relate to emotions. Another category, EMDR, basically says that most of our clinical issues, such as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, all stem from life events that have occurred to us that have become stuck in our brain. And if you heal that memory, then you won't have that clinical issue anymore. And the research shows for this modality, which was created in 1989 and discovered in 1989, that you can use this for a variety of situations, a variety of issues, and heal the person. I had a golf student come to me who said, I feel like I am doomed in golf. No matter what I do, I can't get better. Every time I'm on the golf course, I feel like I am doomed. This individual had a performance trauma 40 years earlier in his life. Was a high level swimmer, pre-Olympics. And in the Olympic trials, in the middle of the race, setting a world record, the lights go out. Literally the lights go out, the electricity goes off, the timers stop. This is 40 years ago, so they didn't have everything backed up. And so the race stopped, and they had to do it all over again. And the swimmer didn't perform that well second time around, didn't set the world record, didn't get to go to the Olympics. That experience, 40 years later, still impacted the golfer to where they felt doom on the golf course. I can't get any better. Now, no amount of mechanical coaching can fix that. It had to heal from within. Once we went through EMDR, we healed that trauma, all of a sudden, performance barriers started to chip away. Didn't feel like there was doom and gloom on the golf course. Broke 90 for the first time. EMDR looked at what happened in your past, how it's impacting your present, and how it's setting the stage for your future, which is pretty much the basis for all of our hu human psychology. We take things that happened in our past and we create learning. 
ever touched fire before as a little kid, you learn that that's hot and that's not safe. You don't touch fire as adults. Reduces depression, reduces anxiety, reduces symptoms, PTSD. How EMDR works, because you're probably thinking, oh, what's this, this tool? It basically looks like this. And as an individual's eyes move back and forth in their head, and the individual is thinking about the worst part of the memory, it desensitizes the intensity of the memory. Because what happens when you go to sleep, in stage four of your REM sleep, your eyes start to move back and forth in your head. If you've ever watched anyone sleep, you can see their eyes moving back and forth behind their eyelids. That's stage four of sleep. That means the brain is taking information and it's putting it in little file folders and saying, this is important, I'm gonna follow you. This is not important, I'm gonna discard it. Oh, this is overwhelming, this is a trauma. I don't know what to do with this. I, don't, I can't put it in any file, I'll just leave it here. So when you move your eyes back and forth with a therapist and you go through this different protocol, you can take that stuck memory and you can desensitize it so that the brain can start to file it away and say, oh, I can learn from that trauma 40 years ago. I wasn't doomed. The electricity went out. That's out of my control. I'm not a bad person. The world's not going to end. And you can relearn that that experience was just a snapshot of something that happened in your life. To overcome that trauma, it's thinking about the very, very worst part of the whole story. Was the worst part the blade across the green? Was the worst part missing the putt? Think about the emotions that you felt in your body at that time, and then the beliefs you had about yourself. I'm a horrible golfer. I'm no good. And when you activate the right and left hemisphere of the brain through EMDR, you're able to get that trauma moving, reprocess it in a safe place, and then be able to file it so it no longer becomes a trigger. If you yourself have athletic trauma, which we all know that everyone does at some level, and your students have athletic trauma, what can you do? If you start to hear these stories pop up and the student says, every time they get to hole 13, I always hit it in the water. And you coach them on the range, and they've got the best looking technique, and you're like, how is my student still hitting it in the water on 13? It's facing it right here. You've got performance conditions to look at on course coaching. But maybe you want to have a dialogue with them and find out when was the very first time that 13 started to become this issue. And really get to understand their experience about what happens to them when they get out of that hole. When you expose a student to their trauma, they have an opportunity to desensitize it. So I like to take my students out to that hole and we just play it over and over and over and over again exposure therapy. A lot of individuals that have um, fears and phobias. Does anyone remember that show back in the day, Fear Factor? Just thinking back. So like if you're scared of spiders, then the strategy is I want you to go stick your hand in a bowl of spiders and all of a sudden you're supposed to be over your fear. Well, you desensitize it in a way. So if your student has a hole or a shot that scares them, you do it so many times until it doesn't become fearful anymore. So that's one way for you to coach student with athletic trauma. Use your toolbox. Use your toolbox of the triggers. When you become so engaged and you can understand where these triggers come from and your student can say, yeah, it happened in the club championship on hole number 13, I know exactly when it happened. Identifying it and knowing the root cause of it can be very empowering. And that may happen between the golf coach and the student just by getting to know your student. Ask them when it happened, ask them what it felt like, ask them what they remember about it. Have a plan B. When they start to feel triggered and they're on 13 and they know it's going to happen, can you teach them a different shot to have a plan B? Don't hit 7 iron again on 13. Hit 5 iron and just punch it over. Take wedge and play it out to the right so that you don't have to go over the water. Can you have a plan B? Because a plan B, a contingency plan, makes you feel empowered. You know that you've got choices now, and anxiety is not going to be the only choice, but you can play the whole a different way. Have your students come up with a plan B. You can always refer to an EMDR therapist, such as myself, work with a sports psychologist, 
And lastly, tapping. And this is something that you can do for yourself. Tapping is basically a derivative of EMDR. It's where you um, tap the left and right side of your body, which can look like crossing your hands in a butterfly hug and tapping back and forth, or you might tap your legs back and forth. When you think about something that is anxiety promote provoking, and you tap your body back and forth gently while breathing, it can definitely desensitize you in the moment, and it can help you cope. If anyone has flight anxiety, and all of a sudden you start to feel turbulence, and you're like, oh, what's gonna happen? You can start tapping, breathing deeply, and that can help you cope with the anxiety. It can also help prevent athletic traumas because you get in the process right in the moment. Kind of pictures of what tapping looks like. And this is a way for you to set the stage, as we finish up today, set the stage for performance, a positive performance. If you want to perform well in your next tournament, and you know that you have first tee jitters, you imagine going onto the first tee, and you ask yourself, what am I going to need to not feel anxious? I'm going to need confidence. I'm going to need skill, which you already have. I'm going to need to stand tall. I'm going to need to deep breath, deep breathe. So you imagine yourself on the tee using those strengths, and then you tap your body back and forth. And you create a blueprint for what's going to happen. You're already telling your body, this is how I'm going to respond when I step onto that first tee. And the better that you get at tapping, the better you can start to look at performances that you have coming up and you can set the stage for your success. A great book to look at is Tapping In by Dr. Laura Parnell. She goes through a variety of different scenarios, tapping before you give a presentation, tapping before an athletic performance, tapping before getting onto a plane. And you can tap and get your body ready and cued in to be its best version of itself before you perform. Thank you so much for being here so early in the morning. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions and enjoy the rest of your show. Thank you.